Okay, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 41st annual Statewide Historic Preservation Con uh, Conference. In this session, um, we're going to speak to Renee Barnes, who is uh, with her session titled MnDOT's Trunk Highway and Roadside Property Studies. I'm Jenny Way. I'm the State Historic Preservation Office's National Register Architectural Historian, and I will serve as a moderator for this session. A couple of notes before we get started. We are recording uh, the session, and the recording will be available on demand for viewing. Uh, as a registrant, you will automatically receive access to the recording um, once the session is completed. Uh, if you experience any technical issues, we invite you to we invite you to use the chat function um, to send me a message privately, and I'll get you back on track. And we've also set aside some time for the for Q and A at the end of the session. So if you will use the Q and A function um, to ask those questions, we will make sure that Renee Renee gets them. Um, before we begin, I I do want to take a moment to recognize that Minnesota history spans at least thirteen thousand years. And the, map, the vast majority of that time is represented by American Indian history alone. From that perspective, our urban and rural built environments are very recent. The state, historic, the state of Minnesota, as it's been known since 1858, is within the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people. The 11 tribal nations in Minnesota are our partners in advocating for recognition and prote protection of the state's cultural resources, along with other native nations with historical connections here. CHIPO is currently in the final stages of updating our statewide historic preservation plan for the next decade. Among other goals, we seek to broaden the scope and equity of historic preservation through identification and historical designation of more properties important to tribes and underrepresented communities, including traditional cultural properties, cultural landscapes, archaeological sites, and buildings and structures. We encourage you to be part of that effort to work with us and others to build partnerships and advance historic preservation efforts across the state. And now I briefly want to introduce our presenter, Renee Barnes. She's a supervisor with MnDOT's Department of Transportation's Cultural Resources Unit. If you'd like to learn more about her professional background, you can find more detailed bios and contact information in the MnShipO conference homepage. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Renee. Thanks for being with us today, y'all. Thanks, Jenny. <clears throat> um, glad to be here. Um, just to make sure that the, Jenny, you can see the presentation on the screen. I can, yes. Okay, great. Um, as, as Jenny said, I am um, one of two supervisors for the Cultural Resources Unit at MnDOT. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking about our trunk highway and roadside property studies that we have um, done over the past 20 some years. Okay, let me just get this going, there we go. Um, so just a little background on the history of our MnDOT studies. Um, it, one, you know, one thing you might wonder is why does MnDOT have a cultural resources unit uh, that specializes in historic studies? Um, it's because we have um, some laws that regulate uh, cultural resources in not only in the federal um, realm, but also the state realm. So for federal uh, federal laws, we have Section 106, which states that a um, federal undertaking must take into account any impacts to historic resources. And uh, historic resources can be a broad category. And uh, underneath, so underneath that law, um, the Federal Highways has delegated MnDOT and our unit to uh, review projects for them. So anything that happens on a road, a trunk highway road, uh, that MnDOT is in charge of, um, we need to look at and look at the historic properties and impacts that could arise from any projects. In addition to that, we have state statutes um, and regulations for listed historic properties within state-owned or controlled property. So we have several um, properties that are listed that we do uh, take care of and, and own or um, are, you know, looking after. And so we um, have to take those into account too when any project comes up. The um, so, so because of that, we've uh, encountered and embarked on some streamlining studies of these properties within our right of way for MnDOT so that we can know um, when a project comes up, uh, we can know what is eligible for listing and what is not, or if it is listed. So these studies have been part of that. Um, 
a part of that uh, stage of our, our research. So we first started uh, looking at properties um, back in 1998. We started looking at the historic roadside wayside development on our trunk highways. Um, so we first started that in 1998. Uh, we looked at the pre-1961 structures within MnDOT right-of-way. Uh, there was a total of 108 structures that met that uh, pre-1961. Uh, we already had 11 that were listed and then an additional 51 properties that we considered eligible. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of what um, qualified eligible properties. Uh, in 2005, we did another study to supplement that. Um, there were some properties that were missed. So we had um, eight additional properties that were surveyed and three of those um, were determined eligible. In 2016, we had study, we had the study extended to the years of 1975 because uh, we knew that those properties were quickly going to become 50 years um, or older. So we wanted to extend that context and that was a, a good stopping point for what we saw um, historically for the, the building campaign of these wayside rests. So we refined the context and uh, you know, it developed it from 1950 to 1975. Um, in 1920, we, or sorry, 19, 2020, uh, we realized that we now had a lot of contexts that um, covered a lot of overlapping things and a lot of uh, things that weren't quite clarified in those earlier studies. So we uh, combined all the evaluation criteria that was developed for all those previous studies into one context for all the roadside development properties. And we also did a uh, final evaluation of some of the properties uh, that were not included previously, um, maybe discovered, um, hidden gems or whatnot. And then we uh, reassessed some other properties that um, might have gone um, through changes over the years. Uh, one of the things that we we like to do is if a, a property hasn't been surveyed in the last 10 years, we want to update that, that resource and that, um, that information for those properties. So that was a short little, <clears throat> um, short little blurb about that. We'll get more into the details. I'll get more into the details a little bit later. Uh, so our trunk highway studies are a little bit more recent. Uh, we only started looking at them uh, in 2013, uh, but we first studied them underneath uh, an overall Minnesota bridges context. Um, we were looking at all the bridges from 1955 to 70, and it was during that study that criteria was developed for evaluating roads that were upgraded to expressway standards. So we had a context developed that um, helped us determine those roads and what uh, criteria those might be eligible under. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and then in 2014, we had decided that we should probably look at uh, that pre-1955 context and see what um, roads could rise to eligible status and develop a context for our roads in Minnesota. So we've been working on this for many years. Um, and I just want to say thank you to uh, Ginny, our host today, and um, all of the staff in the SHPO offices that have been assisting us in reading these uh, many, many trunk highway evaluations and contexts that we've been working on. So um, thanks to their office for their input and their, their col collaboration with us. So we'll just go through a quick um, highways history. Um, in 1905, we had the creation of the State Highway Commission allowed counties to designate county roads as state roads. And uh, we see here in this picture a very early um, road in Cloquet, um, from Carleton to Cloquet, uh, Carleton County. And this was one of the, um, an early road that was uh, constructed underneath the supervision of this commission uh, between 1910 and 1911. 
Um, by 1911, counties in the state designated new state roads. By 1913, there was a done law. It was a comprehensive plan. It replaced the laws of um, 1905 and 1911. By 1916, we had the Federal Aid Road Act, which um, allocated 75 million to state to the states to build roads uh, needed to form, and they needed this to form um, a department. They, or sorry, they needed to form a highway department to receive funds. So prior to this, Minnesota didn't really have a um, highway department. So by 1917, again, they used that funding and, and to receive that funding to establish the Minnesota Highway Department. By uh, 1921, we had the Public Highways Act. And uh, this is really when the highways started to take shape. They were divided into four classes. Um, if anyone is not familiar um, or might be from out of state or other parts of the country or traveled other parts of the country. Um, Minnesota is probably one of the few states that refer to our highways as trunk highways. Um, I've, I've given this presentation um, a little bit more state, you know, through the statewide and uh, um, it's always a question as, as to why is it called a trunk highway? I don't really know. Um, that's just what they called it. And it's in, it's in the history is known as a trunk highway. Um, but they are the primary highways. They are funded through federal aid funds and they are constructed and maintained by the state. In um, 1921, they designated about 70 routes or about six, you know, it's almost 7,000 miles. Um, but then we also have state roads and they are secret secondary roads. Um, they can be funded through state aid funds and federal funds and also local funds. Um, but are maintained by the counties with assistance from the state. So these are kind of like your CASAs. It can be your CASAs, but also we have another um, CASA road um, class. So, um, and then in 1921, they designated uh, just over 8,000 miles as state roads. And third, we have the county roads. Um, they are funded and constructed by the county boards and also, and can also be maintained by the town boards. And then lastly, we have town roads constructed and maintained uh, completely by the town boards, um, but the counties could provide financial assistance. So some additional things that were in the law, um, you know, they were, they were allowed to acquire, purchase, gift or condemn trunk highway right away. Um, they were able to contract with railroad companies for construction of bridges and approaches for separation of grades. Um, they were able to let contracts for needed materials and supplies. They were able to set, you know, annual department of finances with the state auditor and treasurer. Um, they were able to spend the trunk highway funds, which is very important. Uh, they were able to cooperate with adjacent states on improvements, designate the location of the trunk highways, uh, adopt standard road marking designs, and also prepare an annual trunk highway map. Uh, so just a, a quick map. Um, I know it's probably not too big on the screens, but it's just an overall map of uh, what um, trunk highways were uh, designated in 1922. So by 1933, they had met a provision um, in the law that the system could be expanded if 75% of overall mileage was improved. So at that time, we added about um, 4,500 miles and over 140 new or 140 routes, and those would include the new and existing routes. Um, by 1934, we had 11,000 miles of trunk highways. Um, five, you know, almost 6,000 of those were surfaced in either concrete or bituminous, and a further uh, almost 5,000 miles were gravel. 
there was only 616 miles of unimproved dirt roads in the state. Um, and many of those had been added just in 1933. Um, the MHD was looking forward to a new era of highway design far beyond the 20 foot two lane highway of the early mid 1930s. Uh, which, um, you know, this is a, a classic example of uh, some of the improvements that occurred in the 1930s in that later era. Um, you know, we have the first cloverleaf interchange located in St. Louis Park at TH7 and Lilac Way, which is TH100. Uh, this was constructed between 1934 and 1941. Uh, again, we have another example of a newly completed concrete highway in Rochester. This is the Rochester's Beltline, 1939 to 1940. And then uh, another example of a TH10 between Elk River and Anoka, uh, showing the, the construction of the new divided highway with two 20-foot travel lanes for each direction of traffic. And some urban examples of design, modern highway design, showing a median and a variety of grade separations. Uh, we have on the Top um, Hudson Road, US 10, 12, 61, but it's now um, I-94 in St. Paul. And then uh, on the bottom picture, or sorry, middle picture, we have um, Johnson Parkway, Cypress Street, and Earl Street. And these were um, from 1950. So these were newly constructed in that pre-1950 era. Uh, then we move into the interstate era. Uh, Federal Aid Highway Act of 1944 authorized a national system of interstate highways. Three routes were recommended in Minnesota, and they followed established corridors of US 10, 16, 65, and portions of US 61. These would later become I-90, I-94, and I-35. Some of these Earlier routes were just uh, subsumed into the exist or the new highways, um, but some paralleled those routes. Just briefly talk about our um, historic context and our evaluation criteria. Um, so during this time, we uh, tried to figure out what would make a road eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. And so we came up with some evaluation criteria um, to, to look at a road under. And uh, it, you know, they have to first have a significance um, under different criteria. So uh, we, we developed these and trunk highways can have significance under criterion A for its association to events. Um, those events could be transportation focused. Uh, either they provided a new connection to a state to a state or a city or a significantly improved or where it was significantly improved um, example of the pre-1955 uh, era. They could have uh, association with entertainment and recreation or agriculture. Uh, it might have been a road that was the first built to an area or it might have enhanced access to any of these areas that are known for entertainment, recreation, and agricultural. Uh, it could also have significance under politics and government. Uh, it might have been historically important for federal relief during the Depression era, um, or it might have some other areas of significance under politics slash government. Uh, but they could also have um, significance under criterion C for its design features or its construction practices. It might represent an important variation or evolution of um, trunk highway design, standard, or construction practice. Um, examples might include uh, new design standards that were applied or tested before being applied to the entire trunk highway system. 
such as early concrete paving or early construction of three lane roads prior to 1928. Other examples might be a trunk highway that varies from standard designs to address unique challenges of topography, drainage, or site constraints at a particular location. Or it could have been an early prominent example of uh, the effort to upgrade trunk highways to expressway standards. So some <clears throat> examples of that, um, we have uh, US Trunk Highway 61, which was formerly State Road Trunk Highway 1 and 3. This is uh, actually a local street now for City of Red Wing. Um, but this is the original concrete and it shows, um, this picture shows the tra transverse and longitudinal expansion joints. And, and of course you can see the current alignment of TH61 off to the right over here. Um, this, this segment is eligible underneath Criterion C because it's a very early use of uh, concrete in the trunk highway system. Uh, another, another eligible highway is the Duluth Two Harbors, TH61, um, is recommended eligible under Criterion A for transportation and Criterion C for engineering. Um, this was an effort to upgrade the state trunk highway system in the post-war period. The highway is significant for its association with the efforts to alleviate traffic issues and promote tourism in the area and as an example of distinctive characteristics of type, period, or method of road construction or engineering um, representing expressway standards for the period. So the top is at mile marker 15, and um, you can see the, the barn <laughs> to the left. Um, it, this alignment really uh, bisected a number of existing farms and woodland areas. Um, <clears throat> the bottom is uh, some early construction photos of the grading near French River um, between Duluth and Knife River. These are in June 1960. And of course, this is pre-1966 when the National um, Historic Properties Act was enacted, so we didn't have any um, uh, protection of other resources such as the farmstead at this time. So another eligible proper, another eligible uh, highway that we found was uh, Trunk Highway 11, way up on the border. Uh, it was, it's eligible for its um, entertainment and recreation. Um, so under Criterion A, it was uh, constructed as an extension of TH11, and this almost, or this five and a half mile segment from Casa 94 to Dove Point uh, provided the first vehicular access to desirable hunting and fishing areas near the mouth of Black Bear Bay, Black Bay on Rainy Lake, and opened up this area for summer home development. Uh, this was constructed in 1935 to 1936 and completed with paving to Dove Point in 1951. So we have um, on the top, we show a, a map with the extension that was 1936-1950. And then um, on the bottom, we have a representative example of the 1936 portion. And this is just east of Tilson Bay. So I'm going to see if I can share a couple websites with you. Um, so after, oops, I don't know if that worked. We can see the Minnesota Historic Trunk Highways. Okay, great. So yep. can you see me scrolling through? I can. There's a little bit of a delay. Okay, so that's fine. Now we're at early roads. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So um, after we developed all these contexts, uh, we decided we wanted to uh, kind of put it forward to, you know, the, the, the to other people, you know, have it available to to learn from and and, and see. So um, to the public. 
So we developed some um, uh, a website. And so this is the Minnesota Historic Trunk Highways. And this is an, um, call, they call it a story map, I think. Um, but it just, when you scroll through, it just goes through all the um, history that we've developed. Um, also talks about other transportation modes um, in Minnesota. So we talk about um, the rivers and the railroads. And um, so it's just a neat little uh, background for, for the history of um, Minnesota. And uh, then it goes into uh, Charles Babcock and the state trunk highway system, which I forgot to mention him earlier, um, but he was a big proponent of the good roads movement um, early on and, and, and wanted to have um, roads that were passable. So there's some really great um, photographs and maps and some you know fun things of like farm equipment getting stuck in the ruts. <laughs> Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a great public facing um, site for us um, and, and to showcase all the work that was done because it was a lot of research that went into this um, and we wanted to really uh, get it out there to the public. So I won't scroll through that too much. I can put the links to these in um, the chat box later for anyone who's interested, but it's really pretty easy to find. You just you can type in Minnesota's historic trunk highways and it should pop up. Um, the other thing we developed, let's see if this will work. Okay, is a um, historical segments of trunk highways in Minnesota. So Ginny, if you don't mind just letting me know if this is showing up. Quick. Yeah, we can see the, the turquoise banner. Great. Um, so this focuses just on our eligible highways in Minnesota. So this kind of goes through the background of what um, you know we did and a little, little bit of a background, but then it goes to a map and it maps out all the eligible, current eligible highways. And then we all, and then we go down further and it's a more interactive map where you can click on a name on the side and it will take you to a map showing you where that eligible highway is, and it will also tell you a little background of why it's eligible. Um, and then some other key facts, how long it is, where it is, what year it was built, if it's still used, um, and the location. So we've done that for all of our currently known, uh, there's one that's not mapped yet. Uh, we just completed the evaluation on it, so we need to add that to this. Um, but it's a really nice little background and research and resource for all of our eligible highways. So, right, so let me just make sure I go back. <clears throat> okay, so I assume everyone is seeing my slideshow now. Yes, we are back to the links. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, now we'll move into talking about roadside properties. Uh, we started, as I mentioned earlier, we had um, been working on these contexts for uh, over 20 years now. Um, so we have a, a lot of information on these. Uh, so roadside properties, most of the work on roadsides prior to 1932 was mostly concerned with planting or preserving existing trees or seeding and sodding slopes. There wasn't really much thought process in uh, providing a place to pull off and uh, enjoy scenery or just have a rest. Uh, by 1932, the Roadside Development Division was formed and the head was Harold E. Olson, an engineer. Uh, he was an ambassador to national and state conservation groups, civic groups, local governments, tourism organizations, and other state agencies um, with whom the MHD cooperated to establish the Wayside Rest and other roadside development initiatives. The other key player at this time was Arthur Nichols, who's a landscape architect and a consultant to the highway department. 
1932, it was really the start of uh, the effort to build dedicated trunk highway wayside rests. Um, and then also uh, 1932 to 1945 is sort of what we consider the federal relief era. Um, there was National Park Service input, um, tried to do a, a parkish design for these west rest areas. And there was a lot of um, Conservation Corps based roadside development. There was four <clears throat> camps within Minnesota that were sponsored specifically by the highway department. And they were located in Spruce Creek, Mille Lacs Lake, Lakeshore and Leech Lake. This is an example of an early roadside parking area at Cascade River on TH61. It is uh, 10 miles south of Grand Marais. Um, and it's one of many of the improvements that we saw in the 1930s. And this one does is listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And then we have the Garrison Concourse Overlook Wall. And um, this is a photo from about 1940. This one is also listed in the NRHP. And then we have the um, roadside parking area in Stillwater. Um, this is two miles north of Stillwater, but I don't think that's true. <laughs> I may have messed up on that. Um, this is constructed between 1935 and 1936 on TH95. This one is also listed in the National Register of Historic Places. So that was sort of our 1930s to 1945, just a, a collection of some that are listed. We have um, others that are eligible, um, but those were just, I just wanted to cover the listed ones. So um, 1946 to 1967 was a new era, uh, what we call the pre-safety rest era, area era. Um, there was 1946 to, 1953, there was 42 wayside parking areas, and this was a 30% increase of the previous building campaign. Many of these were built in the rustic style um, because there was many of these plans that were sort of left over before World War II happened. Um, there was a lot of stall in the, in the building campaigns during the World War II era. So some of these were still built in that style, but they were after 1946. Um, most were overlooks or walls or shrine slash, slash lectern type historical markers. As we see here, there's um, an example of kind of both aspects. Um, so at, up top we have Burns Avenue um, overlook the best photos. Um, and then the bottom we have Vineland historical marker. It's this lectern shrine slash lectern um, example. After 1968, we entered into the era of the safety rest area. So that, that occurred until about 1975. There were two types of safety rest areas. Those on Interstate 35, 90, and 94 were completely modern with flush toilets and a, a different type of architecture. The second type provided mostly <clears throat> non-flush toilets in buildings, finished in attractive woods and resembling those found in many parks. <clears throat> Excuse me, just let me. Um, they were furnished with picnic tables, grills, informational bulletin boards, spacious and lighted parking lots, and wherever possible, a scenic view. <clears throat> so one of these examples is the Bergen Lake rest area. Um, this meets the evaluation criteria for significance under criterion C in the areas of architecture and landscape architecture. Period of significance is 1970, and that was the year that it was completed. And you can see it provides a <clears throat> well off the highway area to park, 
and enjoy the um, woods and the area and, and stretch your legs. It was also a very different architectural style with this sort of, um, I'm, I'm not quite, I've, I've heard it, uh, I've heard it references different styles and I'm, I'm blanking on it. I should have written it in here. Um, <clears throat> so, but it, it's very different than the rustic NPS park style that we've seen previously. Um, some more closer views of the um, toilet building and then some picnic shelters, beautiful um, thin windows and brickwork and um, just, just lovely buildings. <laughs> And then um, I see what, so the roadside properties history, uh, or there's also a historic um, webpage for them um, listed here. It's actually um, currently going on, undergoing some renovations. We're hoping, um, I've been partnering with our site development unit to um, work on this, their website to hopefully get it um, very similar to ours as far as the GIS capability goes and um, the information provided because we'd like um, them to look a little more cohesive with each other. Um, and then there's a lot of updates now that we've completed our, um, you know, 20 some year compilation of historic context. So there's some updates and information that needs to be, to be added. So, um, I do have the um, website there if anyone wants to note it. It's also very easy to find if you look up Minnesota Roadside Historic. Historic Roadsides is pretty easy to find. Um, I won't show it today just because I, I know that the new one will be really good. Um, oh, and yes, I'll go back to Bergen. Um, I wanted to say Funk Revival, Andrea, thank you for confirming. I just didn't want to say something incorrect. So <laughs> um, Funk Revival has been something I discovered in this research. So it's been, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun uh, um, design aspect. <laughs> so I think that is it. Um, yeah, so I'll take questions. <laughs> Again, this is Jenny. If you'll see to your right, there should be a Q and A um, box. If anybody has questions, you're welcome to type those in there. The if anybody's interested in the trunk highways, they are some really spectacular uh, contexts. You can learn a whole lot about how the state of Minnesota was developed, um, and some of the impetus for those developments through those contexts. So they're really very interesting. Um, if you're if you're interested specifically in your area of, of the, the state, uh, there's some a wealth of information in those very robust contexts. And I'm sure yeah. the websites convey most of that imp the the most essential information. For sure. Um, yeah, the, you know, I have to credit our amazing consultants. We worked with Mead and Hunt um, for the Trunk Highway for the most part, um, developing the context and then doing some of that first phase of evaluations. And of course, our roadside properties have been in development for um, many years. So we've had many consultants, Sue Granger, Will Stark, um, Andrew Pisa, um, you know, even even early stuff by Ralph Anderson. So, I mean, it's been, it's been decades of people working on that project. So I'm sure I've missed some consultants that have had a hand in it, but um, you know, we have some excellent consultants in Minnesota to work with, so. It's true. And one of the things I appreciate about the trunk highways and the roadside properties is that they're often overlooked. They're things that we use every day and we don't necessarily think about how they're developed or why they're developed or why they look the way they do. And um, I find that that kind of, the, in, the information about those types of properties are on, is almost more interesting than those ones that always catch your eye. It's, it's just part of our day-to-day -day built environment. It's what makes this job so interesting. <laughs> yes, I never thought I'd be so interested in roads. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. Um, so it doesn't look like we have any Q&A at this point. Um, if, uh, 
we'll give it just another minute if anybody really wants to jump in real quick. And if not, um, I think we're, we'll just sign off early. Um, this was an amazing presentation. Thank you, Renee, for all your hard work um, oh, and you. in addition to your, your unit and the consultants that bring us these fascinating stories um, and allow us to better understand our trips up north <laughs> and everywhere else that we go. <laughs> and why the roads are there. <laughs> and why they're there and why they look the way they do and why sometimes they parallel railroads, but not always. Yeah. Um, and yeah, if you, uh, if you will just, I think we're going to wrap up. Thank you all for joining us. Um, oh, it looks like. Forgive me just 1 second. I see something different on my screen, but I'm not. Um, so, Sarah, it looks like you asked a question. I'm trying to see what it is. Chat maybe. Um, sorry, Sarah, I'm trying to find your question and having some difficulty. Um, to. Oh. Uh, Renee, did she happen to, to put that in the chat directly to you? I'm not seeing it. If you use the Q and A. I not see it. Sarah, if you use the Q&A function instead of the chat function, that may be a little easier. Maybe you did and I'm having trouble. Oh, she was just saying thank you. <laughs> I love it. I love that we went through that much to say thank you because it is important <laughs> that we thank you for your time, all of you actually, um, both Renee and all of our wonderful 44 attendees that, that came to listen to this discussion, um, far more than we could have gotten in a in a physical setting. So there are some some wonderful things to the virtual meeting. Um, if you would like to pause the recording, Renee, yes. I, I appreciate you taking over those those duties. We'll see you next time.